Good evening or good day. Uh, my name is Oliver and I work uh, for Wolfram Research and uh, I'm going to be presenting about PDE modeling today. So uh, PDE modeling and the finite element method that makes some of the PDE models that I'm going to show possible. So um, I work in the numerics group and I typically work on functions like ND solve, ND eigensystem or interpolating function basically all the functions that um, in some way or another depend on the on the finite element method and i'm going to present a few things about that today so the idea is basically to give a bit of an overview of the pd modeling capabilities of nd solve um, nd solve is the differential equation solving uh, function that mathematica or the wolfram language have um, but um, ND solve is what we call is a super function. That means it covers a lot of, of um, different areas like ordinary differential equations, boundary value problems, delay differential equations and things like that. And um, today I'm not gonna cover all of these things. So I'm really concentrating in this presentation, I'm concentrating on this, on this last part. So partial differential equation solving. And there again, on a subcategory category where we have arbitrary regions. So we have a different partial differential equation solver for um, based on something like a finite difference method for rectangular regions. But here today, we're gonna talk about arbitrary regions for uh, the finite element method. So when I say something today that um, this works or doesn't work, um, I only refer to the finite element method and arbitrary region partial differential equation solving. It doesn't necessarily mean that another uh, function cannot do this specific um, equation just to, to, to narrow down the scope of this presentation uh, a little bit. Okay. So to get started, why would anybody be interested in solving finite element problems or PDEs over arbitrary shaped domains? And the thing is that um, if you look around yourselves, you'll see many things that are just not rectangular. So arbitrary shaped domains are omnipresent and we'd like to be able to solve partial differential equations over them. So that's one of the main reasons of why uh, the finite element method is popular because it can solve over arbitrary shaped domains. The second reason why the finite element method is um, popular is because it can solve a large class of PDEs. So we can solve PDEs from, I don't know, heat transfer, fluid dynamics, um, structural mechanics, um, uh, mass transport and things like that. And we're gonna see a few examples of, the, of those um, in, in a minute or two. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is that it's almost always possible to write a solver for a specific problem that's more efficient than a finite element solver or a general purpose solver like ND solve. But the finite element method is almost always a pretty good choice for specific partial differential equations. So while it's not always the best method for a specific problem, it's always a fairly decent choice for a large class of, of problems. So that, that's just a little, to put this a little bit in, in, a, in a perspective. Okay, so let's start discussing a bit um, what PDE solving is about. So we want to solve partial differential equations um, and these come up in uh, numerous fields, um, in physics and engineering and biology, everywhere we'll find partial differential equations. To be able to solve partial differential equations, you need basically three things. You need something um, that defines what the region is or the, the object over which you'd like to define or solve this partial differential equation. Then of course you, you need the partial differential equation the partial differential equation itself. And um, lastly, you need some kind of a boundary condition. So the boundary condition is basically something that says what is happening beyond the region you're interested in, beyond this domain that you'd like to solve. And the boundary condition is basically the interface between the PDE that's active in the specific domain, and the rest of the world outside of it. That's what boundary conditions kind of are. Okay, so let's look at a specific example. So for ND solve or generally in, in, um, in, in, a, in a textbook, you might, you might find something 
uh, like this. So you have a Poisson type equation. So a Laplace operator, a negative Laplace operator equals to one. And you'd like to solve this equation over the region is a disk. Um, and then you have a Dirichlet boundary condition. We'll get to that in a second, what that is. Um, um, is supposed to be zero for a specific part of the, of the uh, boundary of this disk. So for X larger than zero. So as a first example, we look at how we'd set this up um, in Mathematica. So we'd specify the PDE says minus the Laplacian U uh, is dependent variable, X and Y are the independent variables and equal to one like the problem specification here, we specify that omega um, is a disk. So that's the domain we'd like to solve this partial differential equation over. And then we specify a Dirichlet condition specifying that the dependent variable should be zero for all values x larger than one, uh, than, than zero. So an x is part of this domain of the disk. So to do this, you then call nd solve value or nd solve. It's just a different, a slightly different return uh, value that's given by these two functions. nd solve, the PDE, um, and then the boundary condition, the dependent variable. And here you say that x and y, so the independent variables, are part of omega. Um, and this solve will then solve this, um, this problem and it will return uh, an interpolating function. I can show you. Uh, yes, let's do that. So um, let's evaluate that. Um, and here, let's do it again. So now it has returned an interpolating function that contains the solution of this partial differential equation in this disk. And then we'll do some post-processing. So for example, we'll visualize the plot. So we have a plot 3D of that function. And now we can see um, this is the solution of the Poisson type equation. And we have for x equal larger than zero, we have a value of zero. That's what, uh, what we specified in the boundary conditions. And the rest here, is a Neumann zero condition, but we'll get to that um, in a second, um, what's, uh, what that is. Okay, so this, this is a really rough uh, rundown of how basically all partial differential equation problems are. You will set up a PDE, you set up a, a domain and you specify some boundary conditions, call and dissolve, get a result and do some post-processing. So this is, this is really the simple, as the most simple way to, to solve partial differential equations. Now, the only thing that changes now is that either the partial differential equations get more complicated, the geometry gets more complicated, some boundary conditions get more complicated, but in essence, it's always the same uh, process to, um, to do. Um, right, okay, so, what, I mean, what type of equations can we solve with the finite element method with ND solve? Well, okay, so we have this type of a coefficient form that we can solve. Um, and that's a fairly general equation. And I'll get to that into that uh, in a second again. So we have a second order time derivative uh, with a coefficient m, first order time derivative with a coefficient d. Then this here is a, it's kind of a diffusion type of term. Then we have a conservative convection term, again, coupled with this gamma. Uh, we have a derivative term, uh, a convection term here, reaction term, and the right-hand side. So, oops, uh, the F here, and the right-hand side here. And with this, you can model some commonly known equations. So highlighted in blue is, for example, how you modify this to get a Laplace equation. So in this case, you use this C term here um, and you will have F is set to zero, then you'll have a Laplace equation. Or if you do a Poisson, like to solve a Poisson type equation, like we've seen before, um, the only thing that changes now that F has a value. And in the previous example, F was set to the value of one. Um, we can also um, solve Helmholtz type equations. Um, here we have an additional term now that's uh, a reaction type of term for Helmholtz type equations. Um, convection diffusion reaction type equation. So again, we have another new term here. It's a convection term that's added. Um, the heat equation with the first time derivative or a wave equation with a second time derivative. 
actually, as a matter of fact, we can have any order of time derivative. Um, it's just that these two first and second order time derivatives are the most common ones. Right, so when you, when you look at this equation, you might say, nah, well, it's only just this single one equation. Um, every example you're gonna to see today has been done with this equation. Every single example that I'm gonna show has been done with this equation. The one thing I didn't yet mention is that we can couple these equations. So we can have two, three or 27 of these equations coupled together. And that's what makes for great power in um, PDE modeling. Um, we, and we're gonna see examples where we've done that. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, let's look at a, at a Poisson type equation again. Now we'll complicate things a little bit. So this is the type of equation we'd like to solve now. So um, diff minus C grad U equals sum F. And we have boundary conditions. So on some part of the domain, we'd like to have specify the dependent variable in some way. And on another part of the boundary, we'd like to specify the derivative or the Neumann value of this part. Now, note this, this expression here reappears, or actually I should say this, this internal expression here reappears in this case, just with a different sign. And this is the normal value on the boundary. Now, this part here is never really computed but it's substituted with something that we set, we call a Neumann value. That's a, a Neumann type of boundary condition. So the geometry I've chosen now is uh, something uh, like this um, rectangle with a, with a half circle or half disc cut out. And this blue part here is where we're gonna have this Neumann value. And the red part is where we're gonna have a Dirichlet value uh, specified. So let's do that. So, the way I specify um, this region is by calling an implicit region. So an implicit region allows you to implicitly specify um, a geometry. So here we have from zero to five in the X direction and from zero to 10 in the Y direction, but not this part, which is the, which is the disc that we've cut out. And the operator here is uh, minus the Laplacian, minus 20 is just, this is the F value, the right-hand side value that I've chosen. For the Dirichlet condition, we're now gonna say, um, so this Dirichlet condition, the dependent variable U is set to zero at X equals zero and Y between eight and 10. So if we, if we go back to this, to this slide here before, we see that's this part here. So we just narrow it down to this specific part here. And for, the Neumann value, um, we just say, so this is a, it's actually is a, a generalized Neumann value because it depends on the dependent variable. Um, and here, um, so it's two minus two times U. And then again, we specify where this value is active. This is the, the boundary of the circle basically. Then um, as before, uh, we solve the equation. Um, let me quickly show this. So what's different now is we had this operator, which is the Laplacian. Let me show you again quickly. Let's move up here. So this is the Laplacian minus, uh, minus Laplacian minus 20 equals to this Neumann value. So that's, uh, that's there. And we specified the Dirichlet condition. And then I've, I've plotted a, a visualization of the solution with the finite element mesh below this. So this is the solution. We'll see here that at this end, um, the value is actually zero. That's, that's what, we, what we specified here. Um, the dependent variable is zero. And that um, on the disk here um, uh, that's been cut out is, is this Neumann value, this generalized Neumann value of minus two U. Okay, so that, that's, a, that's a little bit more of a complicated um, example. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, boundary conditions. So we have several types of boundary conditions you can specify. We've seen already seen a Dirichlet condition. That means you prescribe the value of the dependent variable U on the boundary. You say, for example, if, you, if you're looking at a heat transfer problem, you say that the temperature it has a specific value on this part of the boundary. Um, the Neumann value is different. That specifies basically a, a, a flux over 
an edge. So um, if, if you think in, in terms of heat, how much heat is lost through, um, through a window or through a wall or something like that. That's something you'd model with a Neumann value. So the default boundary condition, and that means if you don't specify anything on some part of the boundary, it means a default value of a Neumann zero value. That's uh, the natural boundary condition. And that's why they're also called natural boundary conditions uh, sometimes because um, this is just, if you don't do anything, this is automatically satisfied, right? Okay. Um, we also have um, periodic uh, boundary conditions. I haven't shown an example of those yet. Uh, and these work that you have some um, uh, predicates, some, something this year, you want this boundary condition, the blue one, you want that to be the same as this green one. And this works by, every part of this boundary is mapped to this part of the boundary and the values taken from here are then put back on this part of the boundary condition, which makes for a periodic um, boundary condition. Okay, so these are the type of boundary conditions um, that we can um, have. Okay, so now, I'd like to talk a bit more of how to set up um, partial differential equations. Um, and as we've seen before, we have um, different types of things that we need to do. We need to specify the geometry or the, the domain, so the geometry or the mesh, um, and the PDEs and the boundary conditions. So first, we're going to look at specifying partial differential equations and boundary conditions. And then later during the presentation, I'm going to show some things about how to specify the geometry and generate um, finite element uh, meshes. So for the partial differential equation uh, setup, um, we'll have a quick look at the um, documentation. So let me quickly enlarge this a little bit. Right. So. Um, there's a lot of uh, text here. You can read that. That gives an, an overview of what's available. What I would like to point out is that for specific or a collection of fields um, of physics, we have more detailed information and predefined operators. And we'll, we'll see those in a second. So for example, we have some things on acoustics. Um, acoustics PDE, so which type of PDEs are used in acoustics, boundary conditions, and there is um, monographs, which are kind of, uh, well, which are actually textbooks with lots of examples and explanation of the theory. Um, here's another one, acoustics in the time domain, um, acoustics models and examples. Um, so we have covered, for example, acoustics. We started covering electromagnetics, so there's still some stuff missing. Um, we, have come, we have done some parts of fluid dynamics. It's also not quite complete yet. That doesn't mean you cannot solve fluid dynamics problems right now. It just um, doesn't, um, the, the, the equation setup is maybe not as easy as it will be uh, in, in the future version, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not um, uh, impossible to do this. And, and I'll get into more details in a second about that. So here we have um, heat transfer, uh, mass transport, uh, multi-physics examples, um, structural mechanics examples. So let me let me maybe take like heat transfer. That's something that's um, that many people are popular, prop, um, probably familiar with, and walk through that. So if we click on this, this first is a link that that's going to take you to a guide page. Uh, on that guide page, you'll find all functions um, that are relevant for heat transfer modeling. So we have a heat transfer PDE component, and then a whole slew of, of boundary conditions, heat flux value, heat insulation, outflow, radiation, symmetry, temperature conditions, all these type of things. Then there is going to be a list of monographs about them, and we can have a look at them in a second. Um, there's also, for this case, we also have a verification model. So that shows you that the operators that we have work correctly. And here's a section of, of models that we have. And lastly, on that guide page, you'll find an overview. And let me enlarge that maybe a bit bigger. Okay, an overview page. So this heat exchanger example, for example, is a 2D example. It's a stationary example. Um, it's a coupled example. 
it uses the heat outflow values. It, this gives you some guidance of what these examples are, are, are about. Okay, but um, let's look back at, um, at, so the heat transfer PDE component, for example. So this is the actual reference page and it has um, a, a, like a, a summary of the theory of what this operator does and we'll, we'll see examples of it uh, just now. Um, so this is this is some like a standard reference page. Um, you should be familiar with that. One thing I'd like to point out are these uh, monographs. So this is a monograph. Let me enlarge this again. Is a monograph about heat transfer. Um, it gives a short introduction, um, and then what it does, it um, um, starts by showing what the equation, the relevant equation in this field is. Um, it does the derivation of these equations, where do they come from, what units do they have, and things like that. And it goes um, on by to, um, to show many examples, um, specific applications like um, a volumetric heat source, uh, what that is, and things like this. So this is what you usually find in a book maybe, but in this case, the book is included uh, with a rule from language and you can execute it and evaluate examples and uh, you make use of the, 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 the um, content we have there. Okay, so that's getting, uh, let's get uh, back to the presentation. The point here I wanted to make is basically, if you want to do PDE modeling, there is a lot of material that we have and the best or a good starting point is this PDE models overview page that has really a lot of, um, of starting uh, points, yeah. Okay, so let's look uh, at an example um, again. So we have a, a heat sink here. And in this case, I have a predefined uh, geometry. Um, that I've loaded into the into the notebook, and um, yeah, the first thing I'm going to do now is I can generate a mesh um, here. To element mesh is the function to do that, and this geometry now is has two colors, so it's red and green. And the reason it has two colors is to highlight um, a different way to specify boundary conditions. So all elements that are in this red area will have a different boundary condition than those elements in the green area. It's just a different way to do this. The way this works now with this PDE components is the following way. So we say we have the dependent variable u, it's a three-dimensional problem x, y, z, and the independent variables x, y, z. And we now specify the thermal conductivity is 232.6 watts per meter Kelvin. And we will plug this into this heat transfer PD component, the VARs and PARs. And now this generates for us the proper PDE component um, that we need to use. So while you might be able to write this up like for a simple heat transfer problem, it's very hard to remember and write down equations, for example, for, um, I don't know, hyperelasticity, for example, or um, complicated fluid dynamics. These PDE components generate the proper equations for you. So you don't have to use them. So and dissolve will work happily without them, but it makes it a lot easier to create um, partial differential equations. So that's the first point I wanted to make. Um, right. And the same goes uh, for the boundary condition. So I have a heat transfer value that I want to specify. Element marker now refers to um, the, one, um, the one colored region that I've mentioned. So this is element marker one. And here in the second example, we have an element marker two that refers to the other region. So the heat transfer value gets a position where this up where this boundary condition is active and it gets the variables and parameters. And they're exactly the same variables and parameters like for the heat transfer PD component. And now we can specify um, additional parameters for this boundary condition, the ambient temperature, the heat transfer coefficient um, to set up this Neumann value. So this is now the Neumann value that's generated for us. So. Of course, you can go ahead and write this down if you know this, but there is functionality that generates 
these um, these boundary conditions for you. And let me show again. Maybe if we quick quickly go to the reference page. So let me. Um, so this is the reference page of the T transfer value. Let me enlarge this a bit. And if we look. So, I mean, obviously like for every reference page, there is uh, plenty of examples here. Um, I don't wanna go through that, but um, in the details section there, you'll find um, all parameters that you can specify. So in this case, we have just two parameters. We use them both, the ambient temperature, it tells you what the default is, uh, heat transfer coefficient and things like that. That's where you get the information from how to set up this specific uh, boundary condition. That's on these um, reference pages then. Okay, let's close that. And we have that for all boundary conditions um, that, we, that we have, of course. Okay, here's the second one, it's a heat flux value. And there the element marker two means that the rest of the domain, vars, pars, like in for the heat transfer PD component and the heat flux is set to thousand watts per meter squared. Right, um, and then again, it's calling any solve value. So we have the operator. Now we can quickly go back to remind us what that was. Um, so here, this is the heat transfer PD component uh, that generated the PDE for us. Um, let's go two slides forward. The two boundary conditions, the dependent variable is U, X, Y, and Z um, is the mesh. Um, uh, is the mesh. And then uh, this is now um, the solution. I haven't really shown how I've uh, have uh, visualized them. Um, I think there's other presentations that are more focused on visualizations, but this is just is the outcome of the of the uh, of the simulation. Then, okay. So I have a question. Let me quickly see. Um, so the question um, from Lou is, is that the PDE solver from system modeler? No, this is not the PDE uh, modeler from system modeler. This is a completely different PDE solver. So this is basically, um, this. what I'm showing today is geared towards finite element analysis. This section of ND solve is geared towards finite element analysis. System modeler is a, a product for doing um, system models like a lumped models, like uh, you might have electrical circuits that are coupled together um, and doing these kind of simulations. So they're a bit different, but this is, um, this is a different solver than system modeler. Um, is uh, so the next question is the Landa Lifshitz Gilbert equation model included? Um, honestly, I don't know. Um, but the question, I mean, the thing is, if you so let me put it that way there is no specific um, Landa Lifshitz Gilbert equation PD component, we don't have that. If you can transform your partial functional equation into this form, then it's supported. Um, sometimes it, it, it may um, it may take a bit of thinking, but um, these are usually this is a usually is a fairly general PDE. And the reason why I can say that with confidence is basically this is a second order spatial derivative. This here is a first order spatial derivative um, on this operation. Um, again, a spatial first order derivative on on something that doesn't depend on the dependent variable. Again, a first order spatial derivative different because now the beta is outside of this, um, of this um, uh, gradient. And here it's basically the divergence acts also on this alpha. Um, and here is the dependent variable without any derivative. So what this means is basically for up until second order in space derivatives, any combination is possible. So that, that covers it. If, if you have higher spatial derivatives, then you need to become creative. So then you might need to split up the PDE in a system of PDEs or something like that. Um, uh, and then there's a question. Um, if there, I, I hope I understand correctly, if the Lander Lifshitz Gilbert equation is um, planned to be included, not at the moment. So, um, we, we, I mean, you, you, I mean, you, you, you can, you can contact me after the talk, and we can discuss this in more detail if you, if you want to. Um, okay, let's let's move forward a bit. Let's go back to uh, the heat equation model. Right. So this is the heat sink that we've just um, looked at, um, and the solution. Okay. 
Here is um, a second example. And this example is from, um, from solid, uh, solid mechanics. Um, right, what I'm, what, what's different now? So solid mechanics is basically we have, we want to compute deformations of objects. And this is a system of partial differential equations. So basically the equation I've showed above this coefficient form, now we have three of them. Uh, what we have here is a crankshaft. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to hold this fix at this end and at the other end. And then we have some pressure on these two uh, parts of the crankshaft uh, in the downward direction. And we're going to see how this thing is going to deform. OK, so I create um, a mesh uh, from this. Um, this has 180, 000, almost 180,000 elements. I've used the first order mesh. Um, we have up until second order, but I'll, I'll get into more details when I talk about the, the mesh generation. And now the parameters change a bit in that we have u, v, and w. So now we have three components, um, three dependent variables, and the independents are x, y, z. So we have a 3D uh, object. And Young's modulus is 10 to the 9, and Poisson's ratio is 33 over 100. Um, um, and now it's, again, it's the PDE modeling. So we use a solid mechanics PDE component. That's going to generate the actual uh, PDE. We say solid uh, boundary load value. We specify the region where we want this. Um, so we have two regions here, um, vars and pars. Um, and then we have a pressure of a thousand uh, minus, well, a thousand pascals in the negative z uh, direction. And then we hold this object fixed uh, at uh, everything smaller than 0 0.1 and everything larger than 980 uh, millimeters. Um, we solve this equation. And in this case, I've included the time. So this takes uh, about five seconds uh, to solve. And um, yeah, it's again, we specify the PDE. VARS is just the dependent variable, so U, V, and W. And the independent variables are part or omega of this uh, or element of the mesh, right? And this is the visualization. So what we see here is a plot of the total deformation. So all deformation in all directions added up squared, um, squared added up in the square root. And that's a, a, a visualization plot of this. In, in gray, you see the original um, crankshaft. And in, uh, in the colored object is now the deformed, uh, deformed object. Um, OK, I have another question here. I thought that the heat equation used thermal diffusion as the constant. Oliver's model is using thermal conductivity. Why isn't thermal diffusion used in Oliver's model? Um, so I I'm, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question 100%, but I think we're talking about the same thing. Um, thermal conductivity. So let me go back to that example. Um, no, one, one more slide. Um, thermal conductivity. So if we go to the reference page here, um, make this a bit larger. Um, oops, no, 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 no. Like this. So we can look at this. Um, so the, these are the parameters you um, you can specify. Um, the um, uh, a, a, heat, a heat convection velocity. So that's if you have a flow over the object. Um, but so here we have the thermal conductivity. So this is the thermal conductivity in watts per meter Kelvin. Um, that's that's I think if I understand your question. I think you, that's the same thing as the thermal diffusivity. Um, but if not, maybe you can give me another message and I can have a look, uh, look at that in a second. Uh, yeah. OK, let's close this again. All right, uh, let's move forward a bit. OK, so now, now we have talked a bit about um, the PDEs and the boundary conditions. And the next thing we're going to look at is the geometry and, and uh, mesh generation. That's an important part, of course. Um, so 
you you can either import a geometry or mesh. So for example, we can import a step file format, which is a common CAD file format, STL, DXF, and um, a few others. I, I don't even... Um, so it, the import reference page will have an exact list of what, what can be imported. Um, a second approach is you can create your own geometry. Um, and once way to start is with this guide page is the derived geometry uh, region. So let me enlarge this again a bit and uh, make it full screen. So um, Boolean operations like region union, region intersection, region difference, things like that can be used to build up uh, geometries. Um, we've seen in the presentation before the implicit region. That's another way to set up a geometry. Um, yeah, so, and then here's a list of operations you can do on these things. Um, so that's one way to, to um, set up um, a, a geometry. What I'd like to do today is to look at something that's maybe not so well known. So the Wolfram language um, and Mathematica actually ship with a CAD engine with a CAD engine. And we have a link to Open Cascade, and that's included in every version of Mathematica. Well, every recent version. I think we include it in version 12. Um, so here's the, the link uh, to that. So it's a tutorial on how to use Open Cascade. And we're going to look at a few, few examples um, just now. OK, so I'm not going to dive into that just yet. Um, so here's an example. Um, so this is um, is a bit, a little bit of a lower level um, interface than what you might usually uh, expect from the Wolfram language. But again, this is also it's um, it's um, yeah, it it allows you to to really get your hands dirty with geometry um, generation. So it has a lots of uh, lots of features um, that are not in a in a global in the system context, but it's they are in their own. Uh, context. So we load this package here, needs open cascade link. And what you do then is, for example, we have this graphics primitive ball. And what we can do is we can convert this open, we use open cascade shape to make an open cascade expression. So we've open cascade now, the CAD engine now has a representation of this ball. Um, we can inspect the type. So it tells me this is a solid. And we can convert this open cascade surface mesh to boundary element mesh um, of this shape that we've created. And that's going to generate a boundary element mesh, which is um, the basic type that we use for the finite element mesh. And here is a visualization um, of that wireframe. Now, that, that's not particularly spectacular um, to convert a ball to the open cascade um, and back again, basically. But that's that's the basic workflow. There is nothing more than that you basically need to know. You can now use Boolean regions, um, all sorts of things to create geometries. Now, OK, so let's look at a few examples. I mean, we've already seen this um, this um, primitive, like a, a conversion of ball. I mean, and there's, I mean, I think there's all, all 3D graphics primitives can be converted to open cascade. So cones, cuboid, cylinder, ellipsoid, fill torus, hexagon, you name them. They're, they're all there. So that, that, that's possible. We can convert um, surface primitives um, like splines. So he, we, here we have uh, a B spline surface um, that's specified. And uh, we can convert that to open cascade and uh, look at what it looks like. So this is after the, bound, the boundary has been meshed, but we can convert it to open escape and work with that. There is um, surface meshes. So this is uh, an implicit region. I've generated a boundary mesh and converted this to open cascade. Um, and you can work with that in, in, in the CAD engine. That's fine. Um, Operations sweeping um, or lofting is maybe is very interesting. So this is a, uh, a here we generate a loft. So that means we have three base objects like this triangle here, um, a circle here, and another triangle here. And now we'd like to generate the surface that goes through these three uh, objects. Um, that's uh, that that process is called lofting. So here we see that. 
Now, th so this is just the surface now that's open. You, you have functionality to also close these lofts. So build solid true. Um, yeah, so generate me a solid. And then uh, here is the closed, uh, closed version of that same thing. So lofting works. Uh, again, as I mentioned, Boolean operations, fillets, chamfers, deshelling, defeaturing, um, all these kind of things work in Open Cascade. Um, and that is a really powerful engine, especially for 3D um, geometry generation. Um, let me close that and go to the next slide. Well, all right. So here, here, here is an example. So this, this um, helical bevel gear, and um, that's been completely created um, in Mathematica. So what we have here is a, uh, a curved gear, um, some gear teeth at the back, uh, things like that. And there's an entire, again, there's a tutorial. It shows you how to generate things like this in Open Cascade um, with all sorts of tips, tricks, uh, how to do things like that, lofting again and things like that. So that's maybe another thing if you you want to look at if, you, if you're really keen on generating geometries in, um, in 3D. Okay, um, what else? Okay, um, mesh generation. So that's, so the geometry is one part. Once we have the geometry, we'd like to generate a full mesh from this. And for this specific topic, um, the go-to tutorial is basically um, the element mesh uh, generation tutorial um, that has, again, a lot of features of how you can uh, generate uh, meshes in, in many different ways. So let's look at a few examples. So um, first off, you, you, you can manually generate a mesh. That's not a problem. So you say two element mesh, you give a couple of coordinates and you say the mesh elements are triangle elements. So in this case, they are linear elements uh, and you'll generate that mesh. And um, here's a wireframe of that mesh. And you can use that mesh in ND Solve to solve your PD um, if, you, if you want to. So that, that's uh, a manual way is, is possible. Then we've got symbolic regions. So here, like we've seen before, like to disk is generating basically from the symbolic expression, a mesh, an implicit region um, that's maybe a bit more complicated. Um, and I mean, this is a purely mathematical description. So it's it's gonna be very hard to generate a mesh of this this math expression in, in other software. So, but you, you, you can do this with Mathematica, that, that's, that's possible. Um, I mean, what else do we have there? Right, so here's an, an annular, so we can have holes in the region, of course, that's not, uh, not a problem, uh, sure. Um, oh, here's another interesting way to do. So um, we, we can, so here, here I've, I've generated a mesh from an um, annulus, um, right? Now I can extrude that mesh into 3D by using the function element mesh region product. So this is the mesh from above. And now I multiply this with a line element, or a line element mesh basically from zero to one. So this is a 1D mesh and this is a 2D mesh and I can get a 3D uh, mesh. So this is the, the, the 3D mesh. So now it has, it has two layers and you can, can improve, um, um, add more layers if you want to, that's not a problem. And these are prism uh, type elements, um, so that that's also um, that's also possible. Yeah. Another thing that comes up um, from time to time is graded meshes. So um, graded meshes have do I actually have a graphics here? Oh yeah, here's one. So so graded meshes are a way to have to have rectangular regions meshed with an emphasize in specific area. So these, these are rectangular regions. So if I call this function um, two graded mesh, it's gonna return me a 1D mesh from zero to two alignment central. And if I, for example, mesh, oh, no, I'll need to change that. Mesh region, uh, oops, uh, mesh X. So there. There you see, let me enlarge this a bit. Um, you see the alignment is central. So this, this has a concentration of nodes in the center. There, there you have it, okay. Um, here is a second one. And, and that's one of the two meshes I'm gonna use just now. 
Here's a second mesh. Again, I have an alignment central, but this time I have an edge count of 50. Let's copy that. Put that in here uh, and change that. So now, now you see the mesh is denser, um, of course. Um, we put you compute the region a product and here is um, the mesh for this specific area. So if you have something that, that has a, a lot of activity in this area, then such a kind of a mesh is, is useful. So if I, I mean, if you if I change that, for example, go to, to right, um, then um, the concentration is on the right. Uh, we leave that the same and to do another product here, visualizes. So now, now this concentration is increased on this side. So that, that's what you can do with, uh, with graded meshes. Um, very useful, especially like for convection dominant PDEs where you have some action somewhere on the boundary or some things like that. That's then, then these are really useful. Um, oh, one thing we're gonna talk about uh, in a little bit is uh, we can of course also generate multi-material uh, regions and meshes, that's, that's possible. Um, we have um, PMLs. So PMLs are basically, if you want uh, perfectly matched layers, if you want to have equations that um, have interaction with the boundary and that dampen out some, some kind of, uh, of a wave that's going out of the geometry, PMLs are used to, um, to, uh, to make this happen efficiently and um, at a high quality. So we can have these type of meshes. You can, you can generate uh, meshes from images, from contours. There's, um, I mean, it's really, it's endless uh, what type of mesh generation you can have. Uh, okay, yeah, so good. Um, um, these are the main uh, functions that we use for, for finite element mesh generation, two boundary mesh, um, again, documented uh, loads of examples. So this has 52 examples, um, um, two element mesh is uh, the second one. So this has almost a hundred examples. So, so the difference to boundary mesh is generating the surface mesh and two element mesh is then generating the full, the full mesh, the full object of this, uh, of the geometry that you have. Um, to graded mesh, we've seen examples. And then there's an entire tutorial on element mesh uh, visualization. So very simple examples, simple meshes, how you address specific parts of the mesh, how you, um, add markers so these these elements have the same markers these have the same markers then you can have a pte that um, when and we're going to see an example that has a different behavior in this area than in that area and you want to visualize that so things like that are are possible um right so yeah if i mean have a look at these these reference pages um they have plenty um, of examples okay and here's here's a, a little gallery of of examples. Um, so this is a is a, um, a piston, um, and the coloring here is actually to highlight different areas that you can address with different uh, boundary conditions. Um, here is a so I've I've used the the geometry the geom geography information of the island of Pico of the Azores and use that as a contour to generate um, a mesh that's going around this. So if you, if you want to do, I don't know, um, some, some geometry um, PDE modeling, that's certainly something that's, that's interesting uh, for you. The crankshaft, we've seen that before. So here's a mesh of that. And here's a 3D version of the, of the um, graded, graded mesh. So there's just a few, few images to show. Um, right. So, Let's get back to this um, partial differential equation that we've seen before. So um, these are coefficients that these PDEs can take. Um, these coefficients can be nonlinear. They can depend on time. Um, they can depend on the spatial variables. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're fairly um, flexible and fairly uh, general. This example here is an example from electrostatics, um, a shielded microstrip. So we have an object here that has a small cutout. And here I've used Boolean operation to generate um, the geometry. 
And what we're going to do now is um, move on. The PDE now has, so this is a, is a Poisson type um, equation again. And this coefficient here, the epsilon r, is dependent on the independent variables. So it's spatially dependent. And the expression I have here, if the y coordinate is smaller than some um, variable I haven't further specified, uh, then it should use this coefficient. And if it's uh, larger, then it will use this coefficient. And the operator now is like um, the inactive divergence minus this function, this if statement, the dependent variable, and then minus some, uh, some constants, right. And the boundary conditions are u is set to zero on y equals zero, x equals one, and y equals one. And we have a Dirichlet condition 10 to the three um, at this part uh, of the domain. And we'll, uh, we'll see in the solution just now. So we call any solve operator, no Neumann values and the right hand side is zero. So um, the Dirichlet conditions and this, um, this is the solution. So what you note now is that the solution has a small a kink here. And that's because the material parameters have changed in the different regions. So this SH is actually set to this line here. Um, and there, the if statement knew what to do when it was evaluated in the different uh, regions, respectively. OK. One thing I'd like to point out is the automation that's happening. Nowhere, I mean, let's go back to this. Um, so this is, this is the, um, the region difference um, that we use to generate this thing. Um, this object, there is no no line here, no no division or anything uh, like that is here. Um, but in this case, um, Andy Salt was able to figure out that there is a material discontinuity between these two regions just because it could analyze this if statement. It automatically introduced this additional line, and then this is actually the uh, the boundary mesh that the geometry is generated from. And the reason is that the finite element method works better if the um, evaluation of this function happens only within the element, if the element doesn't transition material boundaries. So that's something that happened automatically. Now this happens, this, this automatic um, uh, intro introduction of this boundary material or in this material separation um, happen, can happen in, in many cases, but not, off, not always. And then you can always add it manually if you want to. So there is some, some automatic functionality here, here as well that I wanted to, um, to point out. Okay. So what kind of solvers do we actually have? So we can solve linear and nonlinear um, stationary um, problems. We have both iterative and direct solvers. The default solver is the, um, the Pardiso. Uh, solver uh, that's fairly efficient. Um, we can solve transient or time dependent problems. We have solvers for frequency um, dependent problems, um, uh, parametrics um, equations and eigenvalue solvers are available. So this, this kind of covers, I think, all of the, the commonly used um, solver types. Uh, okay, here's an example of a, of a transient uh, problem. Maybe let me quickly have a look. Um, uh, no. Okay, so um, here's an example of a, of a transient example. So what we have here is a, uh, is a, a, a duct that has cooling, um, cooling pipes inside um, and we'd like to model. So we have a hot fluid inside and uh, some temperature outside and some cooling fluid is flowing here. Uh, and we'd like to, to model the heat distribution in this, in this pipe. Um, because this has a symmetry, we only um, model part of it. So this this rectangle, uh, this well, this um, region here that's highlighted in blue is actually the simulation domain, um, and I've expressed this as an implicit um, region. If you, I mean, if you don't like implicit regions, that's not a problem. You could very well use Boolean operations to generate something uh, like this as well. Um, that's not a not a problem. So here's one way to do it with an implicit region. So now um, I have a Neumann value and 
to make things a bit more interesting, I made this Neumann value time dependent. So for all time, for all simulation time, we, we're gonna have for smaller t equals smaller 10, we have minus 100 times t, and then we have a fixed value of 1000. Um, and this is where uh, the, the part is active. So this is in the, in the inner circular part in this, um, in this cooling, cooling part here. Um, right. Then we have a Dirichlet condition at the inside and at the outside. The inside, the liquid or whatever is whatever is inside is 200 uh, units um, degrees, if you want, um, and 15 at the uh, at the outside. Um, so what I've done here is a uh, time dependent operator. So now it depends on time x x and y. Um, that's that's this part here. Um, what I'm doing now is so I'm going to solve a time independent problem at t0 um, to get an initial guess for a starting value. Um, so the initial condition for the time dependent problem can be can be found in this case by solving a time independent problem. Um, you could you could use other things here. It's just I just wanted to show different approaches. It's not um, not specifically um, necessary to do this. Um, for time from zero to twenty five, um, mesh we've generated above um, the boundary condition. Here I've added the time dependent derivative u t x and y comma d t means the time dependent derivative of the u variable. Uh, Neumann value Dirichlet condition. Um, right. So, um, no, I think there's more on this slide. Ah, right. There's a solution actually. So here, here you see now a a, a, um, a solution. So you just see. So this is the the temperature uh, at the inside is 180, 85 or something, and going to the outside is 25 here. So and you see how this temperature changes with the amount of of flux that's going over this this edge that I've made time dependent. Yeah. Okay. So that's just to show you uh, a time dependent problem, right? Um, and there is a solution plotted into this um, into this uh, pipe thing. Another common problem are eigenvalue problems. So in this case, we have our PDE coefficient. Uh, sorry, our PDE, our, our coefficient form of the PDE, and solve that equals to lambda u. And lambda is the eigenvalue that we are looking for. So here's an example. Um, we have a Laplacian of u minus the Laplacian of u from zero to pi, and we want four eigenvalues. When we call any eigen system is the function that uh, that does this. Um, the first eigenvalue is almost zero, one, four, and nine, and here are the corresponding eigen functions um, that uh, match the eigenvalue. So that that's how you'd solve an eigen system uh, type of problem. Okay. Um, right. So here's a second example, two D example again. Um, negative Laplacian. Um, you uh, now now we have a boundary. So the previous example, this one example was just a just the equation. There was no boundary condition. Now we have a Dirichlet condition. So everywhere on the boundary, that's what you say when you say true. This means everywhere on the boundary, the dependent variable is zero. Um, we solve the negative Laplacian um, over disk six eigenvalues. Uh, the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions um, are visualized here. So these are the six uh, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions for this uh, specific setup. Um, right. So, one, so this is here. Uh, here's an example um, where we use an image. So what we have here is this mini car um, that's been uh, chopped in half. So someone cut this in half. And we're just going to use this for for an example. Um, so this is this is the image we're going to compute eigenvalues for. So we used um, the mask tool and generate a boundary graphic. So this is now um, the contour of this um, this thing inside. Um, yeah, um, that we use to generate the boundary. Uh, we boundary discretize the graphics. So this is now a boundary discretization. And we can now use that as as a as a region for the geometry for for the eigen system solver. So we solve a negative Laplacian again, um, that gives us the values and functions, and then we can visualize this. Uh, no, 
So there, there you have one of the of the solutions plotted into into the into the mini. So this is, I mean, it's of course it's a it's a toy example, but I think it looks uh, it looks quite nice uh, to do that. Okay. Right. Um, let's see how much more material I have. I think a little bit. No. So um, that's it. That's basically all I wanted to to cover today. Let me give me uh, let me give you a brief summary. So um, we can solve nonlinear variable coefficient transient systems of PDs over arbitrary regions. We can do this in one, two, and three D. Uh, my name is Oliver. You can reach me at bullfromresearch.com. Um, I thank you for your attention. I'll, I'll answer questions just now. Um, if you're interested in an internship or something like that, send email. Um, we're looking always, uh, we're always looking for good people. So if you're interested in working in this area, let me know. Um, okay, let's see if there's uh, more questions. Um, oh, Craig Carter, um, you've written them at the appeals. Okay, so Greg asked, um, he says that I've written a lot of material in the documentation. Are there any plans in the works to write a book that collects the documentation and perhaps more into a book, perhaps like uh, Abel? Yeah, yes. So these plans, these plans exist. Um, and um, yeah, so people have asked me that before. What I'd like to do before doing that is I'd like to finish. So right now I'm working on fluid dynamics. So, so we, we've seen like the heat transfer examples um, and the solid mechanics example. These all have fleshed out monographs and um, extensive reference pages and things like that. And I'd like to do that for fluid dynamics next. So we can solve fluid dynamics today, right now. But um, you'd have to have the knowledge how to do that yourself. So you know how to set up the equation. There are some examples in the documentation now, but I'd like to, to bring this up to the same level um, of functionality like the other areas um, that we've um, that, that I've shown. So once the electric, um, sorry, the fluid dynamics is done, um, a colleague of mine is working on electromagnetics right now. So when these two fields of physics are completed, then I think we'll probably start looking at um, writing books and getting this out in a different form than the documentation. Um, right, so good question. Uh, do you have any examples for the green function? Um, I don't, but um, the symbolics group, they have plenty of examples for the green function. They make use of that all the time. So that's maybe an area where you should look uh, for things like that um, if you're interested in the greens function. Okay, um, right. So if there aren't any other questions, then I'd say we hold here. Um, I thank you again for your attention and um, happy PD solving. Yeah, right. So I think we can conclude now.